Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Can you all see me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, welcome to this is our uh, third, right? Third session. Ma'am, could you please increase your volume? Uh, this is already in maximum volume. Probably you should check your volume. Fine, ma'am. Can you hear? Can the others hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Nevertheless. Okay, yes, is it better now? I think I have increased my volume to the maximum. Can you all hear me clearly? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, clear, audible, visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So your sound is also like really high in my ears now. Okay, so how many of us are there in the meeting right now? I'm just going to see whether we need to uh, wait or just start. Okay, let me see. Hajimi uh, Sabu Bakar has said, Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. So I'm glad to be here with all of you. And uh, today, you know what we're going to do? The good afternoon, good afternoon, yes, and friends also, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we're going to do today is look at the third novel. Uh, and the nine novels that you have to study for MEG3, we're going to look at the third novel. And the third novel is Wuthering Heights okay, by N.V. Bronte. That's what we're going to uh, study today. Hmm. Last class, we covered Pride and Prejudice, and I had sent you the PowerPoint presentation also. Uh, many of you had asked me when is the recording going to be uploaded. I'm not sure about that. You'll have to inquire with the authorities. Okay. So uh, I, I have shared what I have taught, the PowerPoint thing. I have Thank you. WhatsApp group, OK? Yes. Did anyone say anything? Anyone has any question or anything? Shall I go to the uh, novel? OK, I'm going to share my screen. Yes, yeah, tell me. I'm just going to go and uh, uh, start, you know, start the broadcast, okay? Okay. Let me just go to my uh, email and open the PowerPoint. Just give me a moment. Okay, can you see this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is uh, what we're going to be studying today, the novel, Wuthering Heights. Okay. And my name is Anita Menon. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether I even mentioned that in the previous classes. Uh, but I mean, for those of you who do not know, my name is Anita. So uh, the story that we're going to study today, or rather the novel that we're going to study today, was written by Emily Bronte. And this is a very interesting story, you know, uh, it's full of uh, 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 a lot of uh, passionate people, okay, uh, people who are, uh, who are, you know, very much, uh, uh, very much uh, passionately involved with the uh, thread of the story that is happening in this, okay, there are themes of like, you know, property, inheritance, greed, passion, and also how a man kind of avenges himself, one of the central characters, how he avenges himself. And it's a very grim story. It's, it's not like if Pride and Prejudice was somewhat like, you know, uh, a romantic uh, story. There is romance in this also, but it's a romance of a different kind, okay? It's more grim and there are elements of horror also in this story. So quite different from Pride and Prejudice that we studied in our last class. And this is also written by another uh, woman writer, Emily Bronte. So it's a grim story about property, inheritance, greed, passion, and how a man avenges himself by acquiring 
not only the entire property and wealth of his enemies but is also able to exercise despotic control over the lives of their children and other family members so this is what i was saying you know the central character in this exercises his power his desire for revenge is carried on not just with one generation it goes on to the next generation also so you find the larger time period being covered here now the novel was published in 1847 and uh, those were the days when they men uh, could hardly write in their own name and get things published so uh, emily bronte and her sister charlotte bronte all of them used to write but they all decided to adopt pen names also called nom de plume or uh, pseudonyms and the name that uh, emily bronte took on for herself was elizabeth so uh, published in 1947 although she had started writing this uh, in 1845 actually emily began writing wuthering heights in the autumn and winter of 1845 this was published in 1847 now let's talk about the title okay the title is wuthering heights what does the word wuthering mean okay uh, does anyone know wuthering is the sound made by the wind you know uh, on a stormy uh, at a stormy time you know when the wind whistles through the countryside through the landscape through the trees and the leaves the sound that it makes that is called wuthering okay so uh, wuthering is an adjective that refers to turbulent weather created by strong winds that accompany storms so that is uh, the name given uh, to the title wuthering heights in this book actually is the name of a uh, of a house okay uh, of the house where the setting of the story is okay and it's in a part of england called yorkshire okay it's a yorkshire estate wuthering heights is the name of a yorkshire estate where the story takes place okay where part of the story takes place and it's situated in a very uh, uh, you know a uh, lonely kind of place with just moors around it moors means open grasslands so when you can imagine right there is a, a quite an open place and when there is a, a storm the wind will be whistling through that place creating a sound so that is the name that that is given to the book also the book uh, of the book is named after the estate or the house where this part of the story takes place which is also called wuthering heights and it's situated in yorkshire estate now there is a symbolic significance to this word okay wuthering heights it's it signifies the symbolic winds that batter and twist characters as they vie to maintain their privilege wealth ancient family estates or endure suffering at the hands of other characters so uh, uh, wuthering is that you know twisting uh, that that um, tortured effect that all the happenings in this book has on the characters the characters were vying with each other competing with each other for privilege and wealth and you know inheritance to family estates uh, or or suffering you know actually uh, you know tossed this way and that way by the winds of emotion so that is uh, also another symbolic reference symbolic significance of the title uh, it's often you know uh, i mean the title of this wuthering heights is given a lot of attention so going to the next uh, topic here next slide here see you can see the house on the right side of my slide you can see the house this is believed to be the house uh, which is in fact uh, you know supposed to be the house uh, that inspired emily bronte to write about wuthering heights that this is the actual house okay it's not part of a story it's the actual house then during emily bronte's lifetime britain underwent changes that transformed the lives of its people british manufacturing became dominant in the world and trade and the financial sector also grew significantly like we have already discussed in the previous class this was the time when industrial revolution was happening and british manufacturing started becoming more and more important dominating the world 
and when trade and uh, financial sector improves there is an overall change in the country itself now rail network increased accessibility of travel and speed of movement so this was around the time that the steam engine you know uh, stevens and robert stevenson was uh, you know uh, finding out or uh, developing the steam engine and uh, they were celebrating that the first steam engine ran it was called rocket and it ran at around 29 kilometers per hour and uh, so that that was these were all the results of this industrial revolution taking place and uh, the development of the railway network itself you know it's a, it's a big step as far as industrialization is concerned right because it gives accessibility of travel and speed of movement we know that right like i mean our ancestors they might have you know, you know used slower means of uh, transportation but now we know like how how fast our means of transportation are right so that makes a big difference in lifestyles also now wuthering heights is set before such a widening of communication okay so uh, although she published this in 1847 the story that takes place in this is before that time okay this is going back to the past okay around the end of the you know uh, latter part of the 18th century that is where the story is set so before the development of the railways and everything that we just talked about uh, uh, for example uh, see we have mr earnshaw earnshaw is one of the characters in wuthering heights he is the father of catherine the central character the, the female central character of the novel uh, so he is uh, the father of uh, mr earnshaw um, father of sorry excuse me is a uh, father of uh, hindley and catherine okay so mr earnshaw uh, is shown in the novel as walking from liverpool and back liverpool was one of the industrialized cities okay the center of all the industries the liverpool was one of the cities so in the novel we see him walking to liverpool and back so this was a, uh, although this was a, the time when railways and um, means of uh, conveyance became you know faster uh, and that was developing uh, but in the story you find that this is a time predating that okay the british power and influence overseas expanded the population grew enormously from around 12 million at the time emily bronte was born to nearly 20 million by the time she died so significant shift of population was also happening from countryside to the towns and consequent growth of large cities so uh, uh, the population started concentrating in places of industrialization leading to overpopulated larger cities and a shift of population from the rural countryside more into the cities then so because of this overall uh, you know development or increase of british power and influence everywhere you could say that this was also like you know kind of uh, an age of optimism people were feeling very positive optimistic now people believe that britain was leading the world into a new and better age which was illustrated by i mean to record that you know within england a lot of enlightened laws were passed benefits of wealth created through industrial development uh, also was happening within the country although we can say very very surely that the distribution was very uneven because the factory workers you know factory owners were definitely making a lot of money but the factory workers their condition was still pathetic so benefit of wealth was there uh, although not evenly distributed then greater political stability than in the rest of europe remember last class we were talking about the french revolution so the era before that just prior to all these things was like when the revolutions were happening there was a lot of political unrest as far as europe was concerned but uh, during this time within uh, england there seems to be more of a political stability than the rest of europe the spread of civilizing influence of christianity around the world so uh, this is how it was termed okay christianity was supposed to be like within codes okay civilized civilizing um, influence the, i mean evangelists were going everywhere trying to convert people to christianity 
So this was a result of missionary impulse, which developed in the 18th and 19th century. So um, uh, this missionary impulse that was also happening as part of uh, their journeys overseas with this, uh, uh, with the interest of you know converting people to Christianity. So this was all based on politics and the desire to gain more power. So uh, we already, I'm, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with how colonization was viewed, right? The col colonizers viewed the countries into which they went as uh, uncivilized. The people who lived in such countries were called as uncivilized by the Christian missionaries. And their attempt was to bring civilization to these countries, uh, which is not really true, right? We cannot negate the cultures that was already in existence in these countries. But then uh, this was part of the whole uh, missionary impulse that was happening as part of the industrialization. Then let's go on to the next part. Now, Emily Bronte tended to approach issues in terms of their impact on personal lives of individuals rather than as matters of institutional reform or legislative action. So uh, all these things were generally happening in England in the background. But when you read the novels, uh, novel written by Emily Bronte, you do not find these political things, uh, social things, uh, religious things being mentioned uh, explicitly you know these things are implicitly there in the background but as a writer she focuses on the lives of the characters that you will get to see when you get to meet in the novel in Wuthering Heights the most obvious example of social issue is the refusal of most characters to accept Heathcliff as an equal even Nellie seems to struggle with this so uh, uh, the best example uh, that you know uh, uh, of what was happening within uh, the country was, uh, or, or we can interpret what was happening within the country by reading into what was happening to certain individuals within the novel. The example that we get is of Heathcliff. Okay? Heathcliff was uh, an abandoned child that Mr. Ronshaw picks up and brings to his home to be taken care of like his own son. Okay, but like we were just talking about how Mr. Ronshaw went to Liverpool. So on one such visit, when he had gone, his children, Catherine and Henry, had given him uh, a lot of requests for certain gifts to be brought back from the city. But when he comes back, this is what he brings back, this boy, okay? Uh, this little uh, boy who was, uh, you know, covered with dirt and... Uh, unwashed, this boy is what he brings back and he wants to bring in up as his own son. But uh, Heathcliff being an outsider, right, being not part of the family as such, was uh, not really accepted by the other members of the family. As the other members in the sense, not Catherine, not including Catherine. To Catherine, Heathcliff became the uh, dearest person to her in the whole world, okay? But Catherine's elder brother, Hindley, and Catherine's mother refused to accept Heathcliff. Nellie is the housekeeper there. Even Nellie seems to uh, struggle with accepting Heathcliff. So there is an example there. That there is a clear contrast between life at Wuthering Heights, even in Mr. Ronshaw's time, and life at Thrush Cross Grange. So uh, th these two houses, I told you the title comes from the name of the house, Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights is where... Mr. Earnshaw, Mrs. Earnshaw, their children, Catherine and Hindley. Hindley is her older brother and their housekeeper, Nellie, live. Okay. Now, across the moors, uh, across this open grassland or the moors, is Thrush Cross Grange. So that is another uh, big mansion, stately mansion. And uh, although these two are the big houses in that uh, area, in that locality, you can say that there was a big difference with the way that life was being lived at Wuthering Heights in comparison with Thrush Cross Grange. Thrush Cross Grange, everything was more posh and more organized and more uh, emblematic of a higher uh, level in society than, that, than what was happening in Wuthering Heights. So there's a clear contrast between life at Wuthering Heights uh, uh, and life at Thrush Cross Grange. 
Now, it was expected that servants like Nelly would stay with the family through successive generations. So this was how, you know, like once a, a, a person becomes a servant in a household, uh, that was like for lifetime. Nobody ever quit and uh, went away. So they, uh, or probably even their next generation, would become part of the family. Uh, there is a contrast between Yorkshire rural ways and ways of the city. So in this novel, we find that, you know, ways of uh, the rural countryside is very different from ways of the city. Uh, for example, uh, Lockwood. Lockwood is a man who has come from the city to recover his health by spending time in the countryside. And he rents this uh, house, uh, Rush Cross Grange, to live in for some days. And when he comes to uh, this rural countryside, he needs to get used to the way of life in the countryside versus the way of life in the city, especially, for example, like the time at which they have their meals. It is different here than in the city. Rights of women were severely restricted by society and by laws. That is the same whether it is in countryside or city, right? The rights of women were severely restricted. So uh, matters of institutional reform, legislative action, all of these things we can understand uh, was happening in the country, Not, uh, but it's not mentioned directly by Emily Bronte. We can rather interpret it through these examples that are shown in the novel. Okay, am I making myself clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Then, yes, uh, education and Victorian England. Okay, education was not something that was like universal. Okay, that means women were also uh, not given this opportunity to have education. Many people, particularly in new industrial slums, receive little or no formal education and they're unable to read and write. Universal education in the sense that the uh, underprivileged people never got access to education. Okay, Education was something which was meant for um, privileged people, especially the men also. So that was how education was. Now, uh, going to the left side of that slide, okay, see Victorian era. When did it begin? with the accession of uh, Queen Victoria in 1837. She is one of the rulers of England who ruled for quite a long time. You know, she had, I think, nearly 60 years uh, as queen. So this era, when Queen Victoria ruled, is called as the Victorian era, which began in 1837. So those who lived in the Victorian age had a sense of social responsibility towards the poor and the lower classes and artists and innovative thinkers often believe that it was their duty to set examples, which in some ways caused the Victorian age to be described as prudish, repressed, and old-fashioned. So kind of moralization was happening, which led to the Victorian age being described as prudish, you know, like sticklers to what they consider as morally right. Uh, in a way, we can say it is a repressed and old-fashioned way of life. And Victorian age lasted till 1901. So you can see the, you know, a very uh, long period of rule that Queen Victoria had. Many innovations and historical changes took place philosophically and politically. For example, this was a time when the workers' unions bloomed. And later in the period, Darwinism and Freud's theories revolutionized beliefs about the individual. So Darwinism's theories about evolution so science was, you know, kind of bringing about changes. Now the shift was changing from, like, you know, God and uh, everything given up to God to the theories by Darwin, Charles Darwin, uh, theory of evolution, origin of species, all of these things were coming to the forefront. Then Freudian theory, Sigmund Freud, the um, uh, psychoanalyst, uh, who was, uh, you know, putting out his own theories about individual uh, in, and how the how is the individual forms theories about ego and super ego and all of these things were coming out. So people were also getting exposed to uh, you, the the notion of equality when more and more workers unions were also developing. Then although institutional Christianity was beginning to be questioned, mass society still abided by religious sentiments and strict social codes. So when science develops, definitely religion will be questioned, right? 
when um, you see equality and people want to rebel against that you know so all of these things would definitely lead to religious uh, ideas being questioned but still uh, this was victorian era and the majority of the society was still uh, a society that listened to and obeyed religious sentiments and uh, social codes you know social hierarchies women were expected to obey their husbands this was always there, you know women were expected to so social hierarchy immediately the first person who has to obey social rules of social hierarchy would be the woman right so women were expected to obey their husbands respectability and so sexual propriety were the goals and anyone who did not follow the implicit rules were criticized or ostracized ostracized means like turned out of uh, the community you know turned uh, or treated like an outcast so that was also a big punishment so in order to belong to the community people just thought, followed the social order the social norms dictated by religion the oppressive morality of the time affected emily bronte's upbringing and it caused wuthering heights to be initially received unfavorably by the critics because in wuthering heights she has written things that were not uh, that were not um, followed you know by society at that point uh, so definitely you know when the novel was released it was met with a lot of suspicion and uh, kind of critics did not take to it favorably so uh, wuthering heights uh, the first reaction to crit- uh, by the critics were not very favorable and also the public because it defied the expectations of the time it went against the expectations of the time against the victorian codes of morality against the victorian codes of uh, religious obedience and against the victorian codes of social uh, hierarchy so it went against all that so initial reaction to the novel was not very favorable <laughs> going on to uh, what exactly was the industrial revolution doing Uh, there you know what was happening so see industrialization signaled the end of the domestic system of manufacture and introduced the factory system this was accompanied by growth of slum squalor poverty and disease so uh, when the factory system is uh, introduced naturally production will be on a bigger scale and that means more and more uh, labor will be involved in the production but uh, Uh, in accordance you know they were not given proper living conditions which led to the growth of slums which led to the growth of poverty and disease and squalor you know dirt and uh, unsanitary living conditions all of these things were uh, quite normal you know those days uh, especially in these so called industrialized cities like um, like liverpool the cholera typhoid tuberculosis were rampant means were there everywhere and many people mostly poor workers died of these dread diseases because they had no access to medical conditions medical assistance medicine and health care systems were non existent and post natal deaths were quite frequent so uh, babies could not uh, make it right post natal after birth uh, children also could hardly make it so the, this was a time when Uh, conditions of health were very bad uh, for the people now uh, the examples that you would find in the novel francis francis is the name of the character who is a wife of hindley uh, catherine's brother hindley then uh, francis dies early catherine dies early isabella isabella is uh, the girl that heathcliff marries okay she dies early edgar dies early linton heathcliff uh, dies early all of these people all of these characters from the novel you know die earlier than they should because of illnesses and emily bronte herself she died at the age of 30 suffering from tuberculosis so although industrial revolution was happening uh, as far as health benefits were concerned for the citizens that was very bad very poor added to this was poor wages and dismal working conditions characterized uh, the early factory system even women and children were employed 
no there is no rule against child labor and all of these things were happening this unequal distribution of wealth added to the growing dissatisfaction among the poor workers resulting in conflict between the haves and the have not so uh, the division between the rich and the poor became more acute more pronounced during this period the year that emily bronte died that is in 1848 was a year when communist manifesto was brought out by karl marx and this is communist manifesto we have all heard about it. right the seminal text one of the uh, main texts the seminal text in which the working class leadership and intelligentsia found a sound theoretical basis for their struggle so this was uh, this was the uh, seminal the the kind of bible for the workers to unite and protest and try to ask for better living condition karl marx communist manifesto the introduction of machines and the cultivation of cash crops resulted in surplus labor in the agrarian sector so when uh, when machines were introduced into cultivation uh, it led to uh, you know the labor being taken over by machines that means there was some surplus labor available in the agriculture uh, sector or the agrarian sector and uh, naturally when there was no more work to be found amongst the um, agricultural uh, villages people would uh, definitely migrate to the cities emily bronte's father to actually migrated to england he became a respected a clergyman and they lived in this village called howarth howarth is presented in the novel Emily was aware of social changes around her so although she doesn't write about any of these political lot social changes happening she was aware of all the changes happening around her now um budrik writes a story that's a gothic novel let's look at what is it that constitutes a gothic novel okay so uh, uh, a gothic novel is a work of romantic fiction which evokes an atmosphere of mystery and terror Uh, first example uh, was Horace Walpole's *The Castle of Otranto*, which was published in 1765. Okay, so uh, it, it's a romantic Gothic novel, is a romantic fiction, uh, but it's called Gothic because it has this uh, element of mystery and terror in it. And uh, the first uh, Gothic novel was *Castle of Otranto*, which was published in 1765. what are the other elements see uh, that we can connect with gothic fiction see gothic fiction is so called because it employed settings and plots that were associated with the medieval period when gothic style of art and architecture developed uh, gothic style of architecture is uh, like very evident in some of the churches you might have seen some of the churches with tall arched windows and you know there was the tall a citadels pardon the tall citadels the tadels are uh, yeah like you know you might have seen in the churches the architecture you know it's very tall doors and windows and there there are these colored glass windows etc all of these things form part of the gothic architecture this was a time when gothic art and architecture was very popular okay and we associated with the medieval period okay so uh, we have in a in gothic fiction we have uh, employed settings or plots that are always something connected with this sort of uh, atmosphere a medieval atmosphere a gothic uh, art and architecture sort of atmosphere now key terms are probably horror and terror this is the first thing you know when you say gothic first thing that comes to mind is horror and terror okay uh, it was usually set in a remote country with wild landscapes and also in the past i mean our wuthering heights Uh, does satisfy these conditions right wild landscape well, when you saw the cover of the book itself you know like it was a wild landscape and mm. it's set in the past and you're going to hear the story uh, through the narrator it is described events that were often fantastic or supernatural and plots contain excesses and extremes so it it's not in a uh, in a uh, in a um, um, middle level it is an extremes excesses or extremes uh, plots that contain supernatural elements for example in wuthering heights there is a scene where the ghost of catherine comes and lockwood sees the ghost of catherine so it's it's a spine chilling scene there 
themes often work as pairs of opposites uh, example good evil natural unnatural so um, if there is good the opposite of that is also there if there is um, i mean a natural unnatural things also happen you find these opposites uh, there in gothic novels then heroes and heroines were usually young women uh, its heroes and heroines were usually young women and men okay threatened by tyrants rescued from their fate by determined and brave young men uh, usually acting alone against overwhelming odds uh, so uh, in this novel also you find you know one man his cliff uh, standing you know against everything everything that stood for authority and power so uh, usually you will find you know uh, women uh, being threatened by tyrants and young men coming to their rescue something like you you know what you would find probably in king arthur's tales you might have heard about that right she will rest knights although they were not knights here in some gothic novels the heroine is responsible for her own fate and these books include some of the earliest strong female characters in english fiction so in some of the gothic novels you would find where the heroine standing up for herself okay and you would find the finest examples of female characters in english fiction in these novels then the villains were usually powerful men cruel and tyrannical aristocrats or corrupt priests the novels were set in castles or large houses full of dungeons and secret passages dungeons in priest underground tunnels secret passages then atmosphere of the novel was uh, gloomy and claustrophobic what is claustrophobic you know you feel stifled you feel like you can't breathe you want, you want to you get out of this closed space confined spaces, spaces. Hmm? confined spaces exactly confined that's what you said right yes ma'am yeah so uh, the atmosphere was gloomy and claustrophobic and the action often included physical and sexual violence also the plots often revolved around issues concerning war wills inheritance dynastic marriages often in a lawless settings so uh, these uh, these were all you know what are the characteristics of uh, gothic novels these would be the points that you would require to write then uh, such novels were often seen as uh, providing readers with a kind of thrill a delight in being frightened that is perhaps similar to that derived from contemporary horror films uh, Uh, do you guys enjoy watching horror films where you get so scared yes ma'am yes ma'am yes. yeah so i mean if there are like we we get scared but we still have this thrill right that is the same kind of novel that you would say a gothic novel is so that is the kind of novel that we are going to read today then multiple narrators were also common okay so it's not one narrator telling the story you would have multiple narrators telling the story it's from different perspectives going on to uh, looking at gothic elements in wuthering heights you can see on the right side of the screen there is a you know haunting scene uh, beyond the window is the face of catherine uh, she is uh, supposed to be wandering she she's dead and she's supposed to be wandering around the moor uh, on stormy nights asking knocking at the windows of wuthering heights asking to be let in and uh, see through the window through a a uh, broken glass in the window you see the hand of the ghost uh, gripping the hand of lockwood who has come there as a guest so see elements of the gothic in wuthering heights hmm? wuthering heights contain too many uh, uh, other elements to be regarded as a fully gothic novel but it certainly uses a number of devices from earlier form for example the setting at wuthering heights itself has some elements of the remote and mysterious houses of gothic fiction uh, wuthering heights you know mysterious setting uh, almost you know dark claustrophobic element of uh, impending uh, horror always around the corner the events of chapter 3 that is ghost haunting and nightmare are used to create tension and mystery in the same way as in gothic novels somebody please mute their microphones someone has uh, turned it on check your microphones and mute it okay so can everyone hear me clearly yes ma'am now clear okay okay 
so uh, chapter 3 you know the, that is what this is okay the picture that you see on the screen there it's a uh, ghost haunting a nightmare lockwood is a man from the city who has come to recover uh, by spending some time in the countryside and he's staying at thrush cross grange and one day while he's out on a walk uh, there's uh, there's a storm that breaks out and he's unable to go back to thrush cross grange and he seeks refuge for a night in wuthering heights in the house in wuthering heights and uh, uh, you know uh, weirdly enough you know he's given the room where catherine used to sleep this is catherine's room he sleeps there but at night he is not able to sleep he's tossing and turning and having nightmares and uh, once when he wakes he finds that the window is uh, you know rattling and he tries to shut it he extends his hand towards the window and that's when he sees this ghostly face outside the window begging him to open the window and let her in that is a scene that you see here so this happens you know and that was also like when he was sleeping in catherine's room he happens to find catherine's diary and he reads catherine's diary so he's already thinking about the character catherine and he sleeps there at night so uh, there there are elements of ghostly and supernatural and there are multiple narrations so these are all uh, gothic elements in wuthering heights Though the novel was written in the year 1845, the story is placed in the last quarter of the 18th century. In 1801, Lockwood becomes a tenant of Heathcliff and stays at Thrush Cross Grange. Nellie Dean, the then housekeeper of Thrush Cross Grange, re recapitulates to Lockwood the history of Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange and begins her tale from the arrival of Heathcliff at Wuthering Heights 30 years before that is it. 1871 so this is the setting this is how the story begins okay like i told you lockwood has come to stay at thrush cross grange and by that time heathcliff has become the owner of both thrush cross grange and wuthering heights and so he is we can say lockwood is a tenant of heathcliff and uh, like he gets uh, stuck in a storm and that's how he happens to uh, land at wuthering heights for one night and he meets Nelly Dean, uh, Nelly Dean, sorry, Nelly Dean, uh, the housekeeper there, and she has been with this family since her childhood. So she has been part of the action. She has not only been observer, she has also been actually part of the whole action. Uh, and she is the one who tells him the past of both Thrush Cross Grange and Wuthering Heights and the connection between these two houses. And so uh, the narrator, one of the narrators is uh, Nelly D, or the primary narrator almost you can say is Nelly D. But there are more than one narrator, okay, in this novel. And the story is set in 1871. Uh, then the story of Wuthering Heights is narrated by Lockwood, but Lockwood is not a detached narrator, for he shares his opinion about what he sees with his readers. The story is narrated in a flashback. Like I told you, uh, Nellie Dean is not the only narrator. Lockwood is telling us, the readers, the story that Nellie Dean narrated to him. Look at that. You have a double layer there, right? Nellie Dean narrates a story to him and he narrates a story to us. Okay? So you have double narrators already there. Then going to the next part. Charlotte Bront and the Professor to the 1850 edition of the uh, Wuthering Heights traces the genesis of the characters in Wuthering Heights by asserting that Emily Bronte's limited but detached observation of the people around her was too exclusively confined to those tragic and terrible traits which Emily's memory is sometimes compelled to receive the impress. Now, after Emily had passed away, Charlotte Bronte uh, wrote a Professor to the 1850 edition. And she uh, was apologetic in her uh, preface to this uh, book because she was well aware that her sister had written a book which was uh, openly defying many of the customs of the day. So she kind of, you know, tried to uh, mem memorialize this book to the memory of uh, Emily. And she kind of uh, apologized for uh, Emily's uh, book, you know. And she wrote... Wuthering Heights was hewn in a wild workshop with simple tools out of homely materials. So kind of, you know, uh, uh, making it appear that this was a work of a girl who did not have too much of exposure, a country girl, 
this is what she's saying hewn in a wild workshop hewn means made carved in a wild workshop with simple tools out of homely materials this is how she tried tried to present emily bronte to us charlotte's view about the genesis of her sister's novel is apologetic and seeks to monumentalize uh, the work you know, memorialize it. charlotte knew that the contemporary victorian audience may be unsympathetic and hostile towards her sister's novel so she tried to soften the harsh wild and disturbing aspects of the novel by presenting the portrait of the author as a female genius uh, who had you know who who received uh, in that, who received uh, ideas that she had to put down on paper this was a kind of author that charlotte bronte tried to present emily as industrialism meant an economic shift to mass production and quick profits industry individual success depended on his ability to struggle and survive in a competitive world this was combined with a ruthless combination competition for material prosperity so this was the world that existed at that time you know uh, it did if you were in the rat race there was a possibility of making money so uh, an individual success depended on his ability to really work hard and survive uh, even trample upon others in order to reach success so into such a world a book like what emily had written uh, would definitely not be something you know looked upon favorably by the audience or by the readers at that point so charlotte tried to be almost apologetic in presenting her sister's work now uh this was also you know uh, all the also the, the time of romanticism right uh, romanticism in fact it was a it was a reaction to industrialization you know the industrial uh, atmosphere that uh, prevailed at that time uh, romanticism was a reaction to that okay it was a cry for a return to a world of innocent beauty romantics sought the heroic in the common place and ordinary rather than in the extraordinary so gothic novel reveled in the extraordinary reveled in the excesses so um, romantic period this was a time of romanticism when people wanted to find the extraordinary in the ordinary wanted to find the heroic in the common place and the individual uh, was freed from moral ethical and cultural structures and constraints of the feudal order England had this feudal order where the landlord was the lord and master, and the people who uh, worked in the fields for the lord uh, had to obey him completely. So this was a time when uh, individual freedom was being exerted uh, versus the feudal order that existed prior to that. Now the individual was responsible to himself and the high standards he set for himself. this was true for the woman too and they uh, and they emerged with an independent individuality in the novels of jane austen charlotte bronte hardy and george eliot some of the women writers of the time right so uh, this was a time generally when individuals were exerting their individualities their, their sense of self and this was reflected in the novels of these uh, women authors like jane austen charlotte bronte Emily Bronte, then uh, Hardy, uh, and George Eliot. Okay. Uh, so uh, rebellion. Okay, uh, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights is located in the form formidable landscape of barren heaths and moorlands. Uh, like I told you, you know the landscape, the setting is very uh, harsh. and um, not a pleasing uh, location it's always uh, stormy it's always windy uh, it's open grasslands or moorlands and barren heath nothing grows there just barren landscape in heathcliff and catherine we identify defiance of order and propriety and in edgar we can see a valiant attempt at compliance with the established value system uh so we have uh, uh, like i told you uh, earlier he clip was a uh, little boy who was brought in by earnshaw the father of catherine and hindley and uh, earnshaw requested the family to 
look after him like their own son uh, his wife was completely opposed to the idea uh, and uh, hindley that is catherine's brother also hated heathcliff at the first sight itself but catherine became very friendly with him and uh, they became inseparable companions they would be forever wandering with each other in this formidable landscape that we talked about in the barren heaths and the open moorlands these two would always be wandering around and you find in these two characters heathcliff and catherine uh, we identify this defiance of order and propriety they never obeyed anyone whatever was the um, proper thing to do they would just do the opposite of that and edgar is uh, the son of uh, thornton who used to live in thrush cross grange and uh, edgar uh, later on in the story you see that edgar marries catherine and uh, edgar is quite the opposite of whatever he cliff is okay edgar uh, is an example of you know uh, a person who's uh, completely in compliance with the established value system who follows the rules of the land who follows the established norms of the land so you see the contrast there on one side we have defiant heathcliff and catherine and on the other side you have uh, a person like edgar uh, who completely obeys and uh, follows the established norms of society wuthering heights and thrush cross grange are in many ways symbols of authority and power of the old system which is challenged by heathcliff and catherine so you it's the same thing what i was saying then catherine and heathcliff relationship its strength lies in its power for subversion and its revolutionary refusal to accept the contemporary society which is exploitative exploitative and unequal uh, the contemporary uh, society in that uh, time period the industrialization the period of industrialization was highly exploitative and unequal but in these two characters catherine and heathcliff Uh, we find how that can be completely subverted turned around subversion is turning it around in its revolutionary refusal to accept contemporary society both of them in their relationship with each other do not care what society says or what society thinks so in a way we can say that they symbolize a revolutionary refusal to whatever was happening in contemporary society whatever exploitative thing or whatever unequal thing was happening in contemporary society so they are an example that, that is a strength you know that is the strength of their relationship but what is a weakness see the weakness lies in the author's inability to locate the meaning of the relationship in immediate social terms this it's another thing that happens in the story that their relationship the relationship of heathcliff and catherine who are not uh, socially equal to each other catherine uh, belonging to the family and heathcliff an outsider with nothing of his own are never on equal terms socially so their relationship would never be accepted by society uh, even while the strength of their relationship is how they defy the contemporary norms of society the weakness of their relationship is that their relationship will never ever be accepted by society so that is you know the almost like a double edged thing there terry eagleton a uh, critic terry eagleton points out that heathcliff and catherine cannot be united in the actual world they united only when they leave the real world that is it death so they are, they are a pair who are so much in love with each other it is like Catherine at one point says, "I am Heathcliff." So that is the kind of relationship that they have. Yet they are unable to be with each other in the real world. They can only be together in death. Then, what is narrative in this uh, novel? You know, narrative is an important question in uh, Wuthering Heights. So, what is narrative? See, it's a spoken or written account of connected events in order of happening. Uh, like who's telling us the story as it happens right in the order of happening in the order of happening means we immediately say like first this happened then that happened and then that happened and finally this happened so the order of happening a, a spoken or written account of connected events uh, in the way in which it is happening now uh, another critic gerard jenner 
defines narrative as a representation of an event or a sequence of events real or fictitious by means of language and more particularly by means of written language so uh, representing uh, something that is happening right an event or a sequence of events which is real or even uh, imagined fictitious using language particularly by means of written language that is what we can define a narrative as and we are constantly there are narratives everywhere around us constantly surrounded by narrative uh the minute you switch on the television right there is a narrative happening there when you switch on the news there is narrative happening there the newspapers the novels comics wherever you find a message being conveyed there is a narrative happening even the tombstone a tombstone which carries a narrative right the name of the person born on this day uh, the father of uh, so and so right our husband uh, of so and so wife of so and so there is a narrative that is also a narrative so these narratives actually represent the beliefs and interpretations of society then comes a question uh, if we have defined what is a narrative who is narrated okay what beliefs assertions and interpretation does the narration or narrator seek to influence the reader with narrative then becomes a complex presentation of many voices then a nigerian writer called chinua achibu he uh, in his book you know things fall apart he has a quotation there you know the history of the hunt will never be known until the lions have their own historians until the lions can tell their tales i mean uh, look at the hunters versus the hunted right we hear the stories always from the perspective of the hunters right never from the hunted so uh, when perspective changes the narrative will change right don't you agree so who is narrating is very important okay what beliefs are we understanding through a narration what assertions are we understanding through this narration and how do we interpret it so uh, the narrator is someone who has a power to influence and what does the narrator influence us with that is a very complex question the narrative technique used by emily bronte is radically different from those used in her time very different from the other novels of the time now who is the narrator there are many people who narrate the story of wuthering heights okay uh, what are the problems first let's see what are the problems that we have in identifying one narrator okay firstly see emily published the novel under the pseudonym ellis bell right first narrator the writer writer is not writing to us in her own name she is presenting to us the nom de plume of ellis bell so there is a you know first problem there the bronte sisters charlotte emily and anne used pseudonyms uh, carrer bell ellis bell and acton bell respectively so the sisters they did not publish in publish in their own names they published under these pseudonyms and they used pseudonyms because their writing was not what was easily acceptable in victorian society and also women writers were not looked at favorably by critics the next narrator that we have here is mr lock is the author's persona who will be responsible to narrate the story to the readers so we can say that mr lockwood is actually the author's voice who is responsible for bringing the story to us readers but lockwood makes wrong judgments erroneous conclusions so he is not a reliable narrator he is not a reliable narrator like he has his own opinions that he comes to, he jumps to conclusions based on his own uh ideas based on his own personality so he is not a reliable narrator that means as readers we cannot take him at his words 100% we have to uh, uh, uh we have to interpret okay what is happening and come to our our own understanding of the action there's another narration happening when lockwood reads the diary of catherine now i told you he gets to he's given the uh, room of uh, catherine to spend the stormy night in and once he goes to the room he finds the diary of catherine by this time catherine is all, already dead the story is all in the past 
and uh, Lockwood is uh, entering Catherine's room at a at a point in time which is in the future from what the story is, and he finds the diary of Catherine. And when he reads the diary of Catherine, it's the voice of Catherine telling the story, right? So we have another narrator there, the the narrator of narrator who is Catherine, who has written in her diary which Lockwood is reading. The other narrator is Nellie Dean, the housekeeper. Now she's both an insider. Okay, she's not only like you know a narrator; she's also a character who has witnessed the actions happening. So she's an insider, and her narration is like an unburdening of terrible memories over the years. So she, you know, the accumulated uh, all the happenings that had happened over the past thirty years. She's. You know, when she finds Lockwood, she finds someone who will listen to her story. She's kind of unburdening her heart to Lockwood. Bronte effectively shifts narrative from Lockwood's male Victorian perspective to the unconventional female perspective. A very different ways of narration. See, quite unconventional, right? I mean, uh, having a female perspective brought into the story through Nellie. Uh, as opposed to the Victorian name uh, narration of Lockwood, and Nellie's narration, uh, like I told you, it's like a confession. It's like an unburdening of all the secret that she'd been having all these past years. Now her narration is very detailed, emphatic, and breathless. You know, like when you have a story to tell and you badly want to say that story. You know the way in which we would be narrating, right? There would be this rushed, breathless uh, quality to the narration. So N Nellie's narration is something like that. Uh, she's a witness and a participant in the events that she is narrating. She is not an objective narrator. Readers perceive more than what she narrates. She is very uh, involved in the action. So you can't say that she's someone who stands away from the action and comments upon it. She's Part and parcel of the action. So her narration is a very subjective narration, as opposed to the objective narration. So we actually have look at this. How many narrators? You can say Ellis Bell. I, I mean, starts with uh, Emily Bronte, Ellis Bell, Lockwood. Uh, then you have the Diary of Catherine, and you have Nellie Dean also. Look at that. Several layers of narrator. Now, uh, how? What happens to the narrator? Okay, look at this. I have put another picture there of the you know haunting scene there. Uh, Lockwood enters Wuthering Heights. First, he is outside in the bitter cold and hostile environment. What is the symbolic significance of what happens to Lockwood? Okay, look at this. Uh, first, he is outside. Okay, and he is in the stormy weather, hostile environment. Then he enters Wuthering Heights. He comes to the living room of Wuthering Heights, where the environment is warm, but his reception is not, because Heathcliff is there and Heathcliff is not very uh, uh, welcoming. So uh, he enters the living room and his uh, environment is warm, but his reception is not. Later, he goes further into the house and finds himself in Catherine's bedroom, where he discovers her diary. The progress inside the house is complemented by Lockwood's entry into the past of Wuthering Heights, which climaxes with his encounter with Catherine's apparition. Apparition means here, yeah, uh, the specter or the ghost of Catherine. So uh, you can say that you know, uh, looking at it in the from a symbolic perspective, Lockwood entering uh, from uh, the hostile environment into Wuthering Heights, into the bedroom of Catherine. And reading the uh, diary of Catherine is like uh, uh, the progress of this uh, character into the depth of the story, into the heart of the novel. So this travel into an internal, closed, and dark world is similar to narrative styles of Gothic tales, in which the mind is turned on itself and the dark side of the psyche is exposed. So it's like you know walking into one's own uh, heart or one's own uh, darkest uh, parts of one's own identity. Wuthering Heights has a line of witnesses, narrators from Emily Bronte to the pseudonymous Ellis Bell to Lockwood to Nellie Dean to Heathcliff to Catherine, who forms this complex narrative. 
and just as there are many narrators in the novel consequently there are many listeners also nelly had been the confidant of both catherine and heathcliff confidant means nelly has been the confidant of both catherine secret and keeper somebody who keep a secret uh, like you yes. can confide in them secret yes. keeper yes so a person mm-hmm. who with in whom we can confide in and a, a keeper of secret so nelly has been a listener to nelly is a narrator nelly has been a listener to uh, she because she's she ha- was at different times a confidant to both catherine and heathcliff separately nelly and lockwood are continuous interpreters of what they witness so they decipher what is happening around them now uh, continuing with the narrative techniques the early critical readings pointed to nelly's lockwood desire to explain the central mystery and attribute specific meaning to the relationships in the novel so uh, earlier critical readings of the novel you know they they t- talked about the critics talked about nelly and lockwood uh, relationship and the desire to explain the central mystery and attribute meanings to relationships in the novel uh, then nelly uh, and lockwood narration is seen as a bland and prosaic recapitulation of a relationship that in essence is raw pure wild intuitive and natural something transcendental beyond the limits of reason so nelly and lockwood are mere humans okay uh, with their own shortcomings with their own subjective analysis of what was happening and as such they are not people who are actually capable of uh, capable of explaining the uh, catherine heathcliff relationship or even any other action happening in the uh, in the story because you know whatever was happening is something uh, you know uh, very raw and wild and intuitive beyond the limits of reason and universal paradigms were sought of polarity or a binary like polarity in the sense white versus black or male versus female binary oppositions a creative response to the universal opposition between nature and civilization intuition and reason day and night heaven and hell real and unreal order and chaos etc this was you know how it was interpreted uh, pa- universal paradigms paradigms means examples Uh, this romantic idealization was questioned by later critics who offered a different interpretation so uh, earlier interpreters uh, tried to see this as binaries uh, as um, you know examples of uh, opposites happening uh, but then this romantic idealization was questioned by the next generation of critics who offered a different interpretation this critic called frank kermode adopted the view that there were many truths represented by many narrations that could be read into the novel and it gave importance to close reading and multiple perspective so nowadays when we read a novel it's not about just one person's perspective it's a perspective of multiple readings multiple um, uh, people who read it multiple groups of people who read it and depending on that we can read a work in different ways right even shakespeare we don't read it as just a play just a story starting from beginning to the end it can have so many interpretations right uh, if we take a, even uh, you know a work like shakespeare that can have a colonial interpretation or a post colonial interpretation so many ways of looking at a book so multiple perspectives were started gaining importance in the next generation of critics of freudian or marxist or biographical or symbolic or feminist meaning can be read into the text depending on who reads it and how we read it you are you with me do you understand what i'm saying yes ma'am okay continuing with this uh, question of narrative uh, how we will just look at you know some of the different ways in which this text can be read deconstructionist approaches challenge any position that seeks to make a judgment 
its contention is that it's not possible objectively or scientifically to determine the truth about anything uh, structural structural criticism uh, wanted to like you know kind of uh, define language as based on a system right uh, language itself is based on system and structures but when it uh, came to the time of post structuralism or deconstruction they said that you know a, they challenged any position that seeks to make a judgment because uh, nothing is definable in that sense you know it, it uh, there are things that are beyond uh, just easy definitions uh, it's not a question of just putting it in black and white there are uh, uh, positions there are uh, there are uh, stands that we can uh, take uh, which will uh, which which will essentially make it uh, impossible to stick to one preferred truth of what is happening over another there can be multiple interpretations of the same thing that is what a deconstructionist approach talks about any claim to truth or any absolute value is an assertion of a construct which is generally part of a social ideology uh for example we say okay women can do, cannot do something women can can do something women cannot do something men can do something men cannot do something uh, it's part of a social ideology right there is no absolute uh, truth to that right uh, it's it's something that is constructed by social situations uh, the society in which we live constructs that construct is a term that is used it is made we make it we decide and we make it like that so uh, any claim to truth would be like an absolute value or a, an assertion of a construct which is actually something that is created by society and uh, deconstructionist approach uh, says that it's not possible to objectively determine the truth about anything we cannot have one truthful uh, point of view there could be multiple and they are all valid also the nelly and lockwood's assertion are seen as futile because the novel just doesn't conform any value judgment so who is good who is bad i mean such uh, judgments uh, do not have any uh, any uh, validity in that sense so they are futile Uh, some deconstructive analysis suggests that the narrative is designed in the form of frames you can say you know if you want to put in a metaphor there you can say that the narrative uh, deconstructive analysis some deconstructive analysis seems to say that you can say that this narrative is almost like uh, uh, in the form of a frame like a picture is framed a painting is framed and put on the wall it can be explained using uh, the picture or painting frames now how can we explain it using that imagery there though the focus is on what is pictured inside the frame the viewer is aware of what is outside it and not pictured uh, look at a painting which is there on the wall of your home or which is there on the wall of a gallery or wherever do you see only the painting only what is shown inside the frame do you see only that can you give me an answer anyone hello anyone there first one can you repeat it again repeat it again yeah so i was saying yeah, that was suppose saying that. look at suppose uh, look at uh, a painting a painting a framed painting a Painting. hung on a hung wall on anywhere wall. anywhere okay okay so if you are looking, so at, you're it, looking at it what would you what see would you, would you see, see you the painting only painting only Yeah, I would look at the painting and then the wall in the background and the black or the building itself. Yes. 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 So that is what I was I was asking. Okay, you can mute your microphone. So you would see not just the painting. Right? We would see the wall on which it is hung. Uh can you mute your microphone? Okay. Uh, so you would see not just the painting but you would see what is outside of the frame also right similarly if you look at a novel okay consider it as a painting 
you would not see just what is there in the book you would see what is it that caused it the the area around it right that would also be actually part of the painting so though the focus is on what is pictured inside the frame the viewer is aware of what is outside it and not pictured it's a society outside of a novel that actually gives birth to a novel right you cannot write it separated from the society in which it exists so uh, what we see is actually uh, the environment in which this novel exists so the internal actually suggests the external and it is for the viewer or the reader to decipher it there is the outer boundary of a time and place in which nelly entertains a convalescent master lockwood the inner boundaries consist of earnshaw linton interactions with the cliff and catherine relationship at its to at its core so uh, it, there is both internal and external in this novel okay and it is for us as as the reader to decipher it the outer boundary uh, of a time and place is there the outer boundary in this case would be uh, the frame of the picture where nelly is telling the story to lockwood that's in the present the inner boundaries would consist of earnshaw linton interactions the family of earnshaw family of the lintons the family from here wuthering uh, heights interacting with the family of crush cross grange uh, the relationship between heathcliff and catherine uh, these would form the core of the picture that is presented to us through the novel the narrators are the framers they are things there are things beyond the narrators Uh, like we discussed earlier both nelly and uh, lockwood are not um, are not uh, reliable narrators they are unreliable they have their subjective points of view brought in all the time so they are uh, they are narrators but there are things beyond their narration that we understand we put into perspective right nobody tells us anything but as readers we become aware of it this uh, diffusion of the authorial voice and the inability to articulate their own story by the central characters brings the novel in line with modern texts their problem of language and exp expression is explored uh, again time and again you know so it it's uh, it's a uh, that this uh, problem that exists you know like how uh, none of the narrators or how we hear the story is not the complete story this problem that happens actually makes wuthering kind wuthering heights kind of a modern novel this is another problem that you find with the narration then going on to the next part uh, see john t matthews in a deconstructionist reading inspired by derrida uh, jacques derrida a french philosopher who was one of the key thinkers as far as deconstructionist movement is concerned so john t matthews in a deconstructionist reading inspired by derrida argues in the essay framing in wuthering heights that nelly lockwood's frame story aspires tries to aspires tries to bring the remains of the enframe story the enframe story is that of heathcliff and catherine within safe confines so uh, what nelly and lockwood are trying to do are uh, they are kind of you know trying to narrate this undefinable uh, unnarratable story of catherine and heathcliff's relationship trying to bring it within the confines of a framework that catherine and heathcliff's lord is the ghost of the prohibitions that structure society if you look at it you know the story of catherine and heathcliff it, it's like the ghost of it can be seen as a symbol of uh, like it's it's like a ghost which is a symbol of the prohibitions that structure society things that you can do things that you cannot do things that you're allowed to do things that you're not allowed to do so they embody that Catherine and Heathcliff embody that. Their their relationship is like the ghost of the prohibitions put on them by society. It has the air of unspeakably natural passion, even incest. In a way, you can say it's even incest because it, uh, Earnshaw brought Heathcliff uh, to be a son in the family. In that sense, you can say even incest. The spaciousness of escape from tyrannous convention. 
the heedlessness of self abandon the dark and lure of disease and deathliness all of these uh, elements are there in their story and nelly and lockwood are trying to narrate to us these elements of the story which is really hard to narrate but the narrators are see incapable of representing this relation a conventional and self contained as they are so why do they find it difficult because they are very conventional they are very self contained they cannot understand this wild um, undefinable relationship that heathcliff and catherine have Uh, nelly and lockwood can only impose meaning and sense whereas heathcliff and catherine negate meaning and sense so you see there is a contrast there on one side you have narrators who are trying to tame that story and bring it within a narratable framework on the other side you have heathcliff and catherine who are totally untamable characters their relationship is something that is not a uh, kind of something simple to be explained beyond explanation which we can say uh, kind of negates kind of nullifies meaning and sense above any sort of explanation that's what it means uh, now the novel can actually be compared with cinema uh, wuthering heights is designed like a modern cinema how is it designed like a cinema okay. ellis bell you can say is a director whereas emily bronte is a invisible producer the storytellers are nelly and lockwood the readers are the audience the eye of the camera is located in mid victorian social reality it chooses to show some aspects of it and keeps the rest out of its frame this uh, analogy the similarity or example explain how the narrative techniques in wuthering heights creates multiple perspectives and how that deflects the reader from reaching any one explanation of the text so it's not a text that can be defined through one explanation it can have multiple perspectives okay. coming to the next part here so this is the image of uh, uh, i mean if you check online on youtube the film uh, is available of pudring heights i i would highly recommend you find there are several versions i think i would highly recommend you take one version and watch it uh this is uh, as per like a video representation this is a, a picture of heathcliff that you find there on the right side and here you can see uh, see the power of character okay emily bronte reveals character through depicting her protagonist words and actions and their outward appearances so her characters okay how does emily bronte present her character not only through their words and actions but also through their appearances bronte has uh, adopted some gothic characteristics for her characters but has made them her own creations as well heathcliff is one of the most discussed characters in literature uh, intensely passionate wild revengeful he nevertheless forces a sympathetic response from the readers when you read the novel you will only have sympathy Uh, towards heathcliff even though heathcliff does uh, on many instances behave as a villain in the story we still have our hearts with heathcliff and what he has undergone uh, so but see uh, intensely passionate wild revengeful he poses a sympathetic response from the uh, readers now uh, mr hern earnshaw when he brings heathcliff okay this is what he says but you must even take it as a gift of god though it's as dark almost as if it came from the devil this is how mr ronshaw describes this small boy he clip when he brings him to his house for the first time so you take it as a gift of god he's taken as a gift of god even though he looks dark and dirty like a gift from hell like as if he has come from hell itself this is how ronshaw presents he clip he does not make his family happy with this gift although he calls heathcliff a gift of god his family is very unhappy with uh, their father bringing this boy from the streets into their home now you can see this is there are so many names in the novel you know it's uh, best that you kind of understand what these names are and who they belong to 
So as I said at the beginning, there are two houses. On one side, you maybe have Wuthering Heights. On the other side, you have Thrush Cross Range. And in Wuthering Heights, you have, uh, see the uh, left side of the screen, first image there, uh, Mr. Own Shop and Mrs. Own Shop. And they have uh, uh, two children. One is Hindley and the other one is Catherine. And Hindley marries Francis and they have a son called Hareton Earnshaw. Are you with me? This is this is something that you can easily understand. That's why I put yes, it in. Yeah, so like it, it's almost like a family tree so that we can understand. Then on the other side, you have the people from Thrush Cross Grange. That is old Mr. Linton and Mrs. Linton. And they have uh, two children, Edgar Linton and Isabella Linton. Now Isabella Linton marries Heathcliff. And Edgar Linton marries uh, Catherine. And they have a daughter called Kathy. And Isabella and Heathcliff has a son called Linton Heathcliff. Now, uh, yeah, that is. these are the characters, okay, that you meet. Uh, now, of course, Nelly is there. Nelly is not pictured here. And we have Mr. Lockwood also. So these are the, uh, some of the other characters. But the main characters uh, from these two families are presented here. Now, uh, let's look at the character of Heathcliff. Okay? Heathcliff is presented as a dark uh, person, like evoking a metaphysical idea of dark powers, the classic Christian principles of duality, God and devil, light and darkness, good and evil. So that is how Heathcliff is presented, you know, presented as a dark uh, uh, hero, uh, almost like you know this idea of dark powers, the classic Christian principles of good versus bad, dark versus light, uh, God and devil. These are the ideas that uh, Heathcliff evokes. Heathcliff, the name of Mr. Earnshaw's dead son. So he, Heathcliff is also the name of one of uh, uh, the children that Mr. Earnshaw had who died in uh, child childhood itself. And uh, when he brings this uh, boy Heathcliff, he gives him the name of his son. That's how he gets a name Heathcliff. Then, uh, but Heathcliff is not a family member and becomes instrumental in creating disorder and chaos and subverting the very principles and ideals on which society functions. Uh, Again, you know, there are questions of property and everything, which is one of the reasons why uh, Earnshaw's wife does not welcome this child into the family. She's worried about uh, her son's inheritance. Uh, then uh, Heathcliff evokes both the idea of the heath, a barren, heath means a barren, desolate landscape, and the heathen means a primitive or uncivilized or pagan or a pre-Christian uh, person that is these are the name these are the i mean ideas that uh, come to mind when you say the name heathcliff because heath means open uh, grassland like barren uh, landscape that's what you know bleak and barren landscape that's what comes to mind then uh, heathen when you say the word heathen in english uh, it it refers to uh, uh, someone who's uh, you know predating Christian beliefs or like people who worshipped idols, uh, pagan, they, they were called pagans. Uh, in other words, you can say in simpler word, you can say primitive. Christians considered heathens to be primitive. So his name also evokes the ragged, tantalizingly edgy geographical features of the cliff. The cliff is rocky and you know, rough and zigzag and torn. That is, a, uh, that is a look that we have in our mind when we say cliff. So Heath and Cliff, Heath Cliff, the name itself evokes everything that is uh, related to uh, something which is primitive, dark, foreboding. That is the kind of name that he has. All the shades of Byronic hero can be seen. Unlike the typical Byronic hero, there is no masochism. He does not like believe in harming himself. Rather, we can see shades of the sadist in Heathcliff. Now, so he, we, uh, is Heathcliff a Byronic hero? That's a, a question that rises up uh, often. But we can say that, you know, we can see traces of a Byronic hero, but he cannot be fully a Byronic hero because 
you see that there are shades of sadism in Heathcliff. Uh, sadistic behavior, you know, like gaining pleasure from hurting others. So what is a Byronic hero? See, the, on the right side of the screen, uh, defining characters of a Byronic hero. Uh, typically, uh, a Byronic hero would have a dislike for society and its rules and regulations, would be an exile, an outcast, or an outlaw, arrogant, cunning, cynical, very skeptical, uh, disrespectful of rank or privilege, emotionally conflicted and moody, high levels of intelligence and perception, mysterious, magnetic, charismatic, uh, seductive, uh, self-critical and introspective, self-destructive also, uh, struggles with integrity, troubled past. However, there is always some sort of, you know, all these negative qualities could be there, but uh, there is always some sort of a redeeming quality or action and they always choose to do the right thing in the end. Here he, uh, we cannot say in strict terms that he always does the right thing because he derives a sort of, sort of sadistic pleasure in hurting others. He's, he's so, you know, hurt by whatever has happened in his own life that he seems to get pleasure from uh, from completely wrecking the lives of the next generation. Heathcliff's suffering is a manifestation of real loss, the death of his beloved Catherine. His acute consciousness of the injustices he suffered is enough for him to plot the destruction of others. So uh, we can say that he has shades of a Byronic hero, although he is not a fully uh, you know, developed Byronic hero. Then, uh, Again, for diving further into the explanation of the character of Heathcliff. Uh, Heathcliff desires revenge by treating Hindley's son, Hathed, badly. So uh, Hed, uh, just as Hindley treated Heathcliff badly, that is, Hindley is Catherine's brother. Just as Hindley treated uh, Heathcliff very badly while they were growing up, giving Heathcliff only the position of a servant in the house, just like that, when Hindley dies, Hindley's son, Hareton, comes to uh, Heathcliff's charge. He becomes the guardian of uh, Hindley's son. And he's determined to destroy Hindley's son, Hareton. Now, this is what he says. There is a quote here. Now, my bonny lad, you are mine. And we'll see if one tree won't grow as crooked as another with the same wind to twist it. So these are the words spoken by Heathcliff. This clearly shows intention of revenge. Uh, in his mind, right? He is telling Hareton, I mean, we feel that this is not right, isn't it? Hareton is not responsible for the uh, faults of his father. Yet Heathcliff is so uh, revengeful that he wants to uh, give Hareton the same sort of uh, treatment, second rate treatment that he got while he was growing up. And he tells, Bonnie lad, you're mine. And we'll see if one tree won't grow as crooked as another with the same wind to twist it. So I will be the wind that will twist you and you will become as crooked as myself. This is what he's telling. The son of Kinsey. Heathcliff's unnatural and intense bonding with Catherine can be contrasted with his cold, calculated and dubious relationship with the infatuated Isabella. Uh, like when uh, Catherine marries Edgar, uh, Isabella looks uh, around her and sees Heathcliff. He, he comes back, he, he goes missing for some years and he comes back uh, grown into a young, dignified looking gentleman and has made a lot of money also. And Isabella falls for him. Now, uh, Heathcliff's uh, bonding with Catherine uh, is something which is, you know, beyond any relationship that both of them have with anyone on this planet. But that is a direct contrast. I mean, the intense love that Catherine and Heathcliff have for each other is a direct contrast to the relationship that Heathcliff has with Isabella. Although he marries Isabella, he does that to take revenge against Edgar because Isabella is Edgar's sister. So he does that mainly to take revenge against everyone else and also with an eye on the wealth he would get from that. Uh, Nelly's description of Heathcliff on his return shows his transformation from an unkempt, uh, rude young boy to a handsome man. 
tall, athletic, and well formed. He has an intelligent look, and his manner is dignified. So after Catherine marries Edgar, Heathcliff is heartbroken, and he leaves that place and comes back only some years later. And when he comes back, he's completely changed. He's grown into a handsome man who's tall and athletic and well formed. And this is the man that Isabella sees and gets infatuated with. Heathcliff himself demolishes the notion of a romantic hero in his analysis of Isabella's infatuation, acting on false impressions she cherished. This is how he describes Isabella's infatuation, that she was getting false impressions about himself. And that is how she agrees to marry Heathcliff. Heathcliff is neither a typical Byronic hero nor a typical romantic hero. The reader's sympathy is drawn towards Heathcliff, who, even while he's being treated shabbily as an outcast, tells Nelly, Nelly, make me decent, I'm going to be good. So these are the moments when you see uh, into the heart of Heathcliff. We can call him a dark hero, we can call him a revengeful hero, you know, we can uh, see him as a force of evil and all that. Yet, when you see him, you know, being uh, being discriminated against in the household in which he grew up, never given the status of a son, although Mr. Ronshaw brought him as a son of the house, uh, never uh, given a chance to measure up to the other children in the household. And then he tells Nelly, Nelly, the uh, servant girl, is the only one to whom he can turn in that sense. And he once tells Nelly, Nelly, make me neat and clean, make me look uh, presentable. I want to be good. So when you when he says that, you know, you see the element of vulnerability, the uh, uh, the uh, I mean heartbreaking vulnerable side of Heathcliff in his words there. So we see only Heathcliff as a character fighting social exploitation, injustices, and the moral world of the society. He doesn't have a chance, right? He fights all these injustices in the world, yet he doesn't have a chance. Now, uh, Heathcliff judge, uh, uh, you know, secular and uh, the part of him, uh, which is, you know, uh, described in the novel in a variety of ways by other characters, how he's judged, you know, uh, in by other characters uh, in the novel. See the terms that they use, very derogatory terms that are used to describe him. Look at that. You can just run your eyes. See, so many bad words he's called. Evil beast, unclaimed creature, uncivilized, uh, then um, naughty, swearing boy, sullen, patient child, hardened to ill treatment, Judas, traitor, deliberate deceiver, black villain, monster, ungrateful brute, low ruffian. All of these are words uh, that, you know, are called by different characters. Uh, Heathcliff is called by different characters. Now, if an analysis of these descriptive terms is made, we will recognize that most of them are to do with Heathcliff being uncivilized and socially unacceptable. The other terms italicized are moral censors that emerge from Christian beliefs. So let's say, look at the uh, italicized words there, Judas, uh, clouded windows of hell, incarnate goblin, that is like calling him Satan. Okay, these are all uh, words that are coming from Christian beliefs. So this was how he was looked at by various uh, characters around him. Probably the same way in which another uh, character, another boy in the real world would have been treated in the world, in society at that time. Now, frustrated in love, he unleashes her hatred. Heathcliff has a fractured psyche, and the strange circumstances of his childhood make his adult personality deformed and perverse. So he, we can interpret the character of Heathcliff as having been broken by his circumstances, right? His revengeful attitude does not come on its own. It is society which leads him to become uh, like that. He's also third angle to the love triangle of Catherine, Edgar, and himself. He is deprived of his love, not because he is rejected by Catherine, but because he lacks social status and sanction. And that is something he rebels against with vengeance. 
so he is not taking revenge against the people of his family actually he is taking revenge against society and how society condemned him to live a life without the love of his life that is catherine and catherine loves him yet uh, she is very aware that theirs will not be a uh, relationship accepted by society and that's why she marries edgar in spite of the fact that catherine chooses to marry edgar he knows that it is he whom she loves because of the factors that prompted her choice has nothing to do with their love love is a different thing and the society in which they live is a different thing and he cliff is treated as a social outcast wherever he goes wuthering heights or thrush cross grange and the wild moors represent liberation from the oppressive society to catherine and So the wild moors, where none of the rules of society apply, and none of the restrictions of uh, Wuthering Heights or Thrush Cross Grange apply, that is where both of them find freedom. That is where both of them find uh, unfettered expression to their emotions. Now going on, see heaven, hell, sin, purgatory, redemption, death, and afterlife are important aspects in the novel. Emily was familiar with religious views. She was a daughter of a clergyman. She was familiar with religious views. She believed that suffering on earth would lead to glory in heaven, and th these are the beliefs that she was familiar with. Look at this: hell exists only on earth, and no soul suffers torment after death. A soul that has suffered sufficiently on earth attains its heaven. A soul that has not suffered is in limbo for a time. but is redeemed by other suffering if not by its soul so uh, a soul that is still wandering on earth can uh, get can get freedom or redemption uh, by through the suffering of others so these were uh, as a daughter of a clergyman she was aware of these beliefs now nelly's views about death are conventional and emerge from christian beliefs of repentance leading to salvation but for he thinks there is no need of repentance as he feels he has already attained heaven through death so uh, for him uh, death meant unification with catherine uh, beyond the laws of uh, society on earth beyond any restrictions or any rules that would come between the two of them so he doesn't believe in repentance because for him uh, death itself is a passage way to heaven uniting he cliff finally and eternally with his beloved catherine so you see the difference in views about death between nelly and he cliff nelly has a typical conventional christian belief of repentance but he cliff doesn't have any need for that he cliff disregards the people he uses as tools in his revenge so that's another aspect of his character he doesn't care you know how he treats the people like isabella and hertin how he treats them because he is motivated by revenge he brings up hindley son to be de as degraded as possible yet uh, we can say that he displays some regard even empathy for hertin seeing elements of himself in the uncultivated land he doesn't give hertin any education he doesn't he treats hertin exactly as hindley had treated him while he was growing up. has had treated he cliff himself while he was growing up so uh, although he is instrumental in uh, uh, in uh, stunting the proper growth of hindley uh, he does feel sometimes you know a sort of empathy sort of connection between his own childhood and the childhood of hert uh, it's but nevertheless you know in spite of all that he has done to hert when he cliff dies there is no one to mourn the death of heathcliff it is only hertin who feels that you know feels at least a little bit sad on the death of heathcliff then uh, yeah so catherine you know this is uh, how is catherine uh, seen okay significance of catherine Uh, the Catherine, in relation to some conventional and stereotypical images of the woman in the Victorian age, uh, that Catherine too is potentially subversive and revolts against many of the male-centric ideologies and structures of her time, including marriage. 
So, uh, Catherine is the product of the Victorian age in which the novel is based. Yet, she is also subversive. She also uh, is able to defy the rules and conventions of society. She is also able to revolt against many of the male centric ideologies that existed at that time, uh, even uh, including her marriage. You know, uh, Catherine, after staying at Thrushcross Grange, changed from a wild girl to a fine lady. So one day what happens is that while they are running around the moor or the heath, uh, <clears throat> Catherine gets hurt and uh, she had no way of coming back to Wuthering Heights and she is taken uh, for medical attention to Thrush Cross Grange and she lives there for some time. And uh, in, in the course of that time that she spends away from Wuthering Heights and away from Heathcliff, uh, she comes into contact with Edgar, she comes into contact with Isabella and their parents and their lifestyle. And when she comes back, you know, she has become a changed girl. She's no longer the wild Catherine who went away from Wuthering Heights. She comes back dressed like a lady and talks like a lady, behaves like a lady. She's dressed in fine silken gowns, etc. Yet, in spite of all that, you know, the first inquiry that she makes when she returns is about Heathcliff. And when she sees him, she runs to embrace him and kiss him. So, uh, see, there is a relationship which is beyond any of the conventions that society could impose on them. The novel blurs what is acquired and what is natural and what is desirable and what one actually desires. So, uh, what is acquired, you know, th this uh, air of sophistication that Catherine has acquired uh, is something which is uh, kind of artificial uh, as opposed to her natural instincts. And uh, she wants to uh, desire Edgar because that is acceptable. You know, that is what is uh, considered acceptable by the society. But what she actually desires is the love of Heathcliff. So uh, you find that uh, contradiction there, you know, uh, Catherine understands in order to survive in this world, she will have to go with the uh, norms of society. Even then, she, you know, she tells uh, Nelly that she is doing it so that she can help uh, Heathcliff. Uh, anyway, going on, see, just as Catherine's outward poise and self-control are unable to contain her natural impetuosity behind Heathcliff's external dignity, lies the half-civilized ferocity. So they are both uh, untamable characters. Metaphorically, they are untamable characters. None of the rules of society can bind them down, whether it is Catherine or Heathcliff. Now, Emily Bronte shows in this novel how the categories of the cultured and the savage are interchangeable. Victorian society was something that wanted a cultured I wanted those accepted norms of society to be followed by everyone. But Emily Bronte, through this character, you know, through the characters of both Heathcliff and Ka uh, Catherine, wants to tell us that the uh, cultured and the savage are not actually uh, like binaries. They are not uh, diametrically opposite to each other. They are interchangeable, very interchangeable and close uh, to each other. In the mid-Victorian England, where to become a lord and a lady was perhaps the ultimate goal in upward social mobility of the aspiring middle classes with money acquired from new industry and the colonial imperial adventures, Emily Bronte is able to systematically challenge and expose the values that create social hierarchy. Because these two characters are fighting against any social hierarchy. So uh, the mid-Victorian society at that point, which was uh, thriving on the system of uh, social order, upward social mobility, becoming a noble woman or a noble man, lord or lady, all that, you know, were, uh, um, were positions that Catherine and Heathcliff never aspired to, never wanted in their own lives. So through them, uh, Emily Bronte is showing us, you know, that these are aspirations that can be broken. These are not aspirations that are hard and fast. Now, example, Catherine moves from Wuthering Heights to Thrushcross Grange. Cathy has to move from Granges to Heights. Cathy is the daughter of Catherine. Okay? 
So uh, Catherine moved from Wuthering Heights to Rushcross Grange. Yeah? Uh, and uh, Kathy has to move from Grange to Heights. Both Kathy and Hareton have to undergo this uh, process of unlearning before they can discover real affection. So real affection comes when they no longer listen to the uh, conventions of society. No. Uh, Kathy uh, comes to uh, Wuthering Heights as uh, the wife of uh, Heathcliff's son, Linton. Linton dies early, leaving Kathy, young Kathy a widow. And uh, Kathy uh, is finding uh, life in Wuthering Heights pretty hard and is naturally drawn towards the kind and gentle behavior of Hareton. And uh, both of them have to unlearn a lot of things before they can break the conventions of society and find real affection for each other. Then, um, uh, how was you know the woman's role defined at that time? A woman's role definitely was defined by patriarchy. Oops, sorry. Uh, was definitely. Uh, ruled by patriarchy. In Victorian age, with more inflow of wealth, middle classes started giving more importance to education. And more women got opportunity for education and came out in search of jobs. Bronte sisters all worked as governesses. Looking at Emily Bronte's own life, uh, she had worked as governess. Now, how did, uh, how, what was the position of uh, women at that point? You know, how, how did uh, they exist? Uh, it was definitely ruled by patriarchy. Men were the ones who decided the role of women. Uh, yet, uh, this was also, you know, with the coming of wealth, Victorian society, uh, growth of industrialization, growth of uh, wealth coming into the nation. This was also the time when the middle class people were giving more importance to education. And uh, women were looking for job opportunities. Not many opportunities were open to them. Yet many of them uh, worked as governesses. In fact, uh, Emily Bronte herself, along with all her sisters, had worked as governesses. Victorian men wanted women who were not only educated, ladylike, but also subservient enough to manage kitchen and children. This was the idea that you know men of that time had. So a woman needed to have education, but uh, what was considered eminently desirable was the ability to not only be able to read and write, but also be able to manage the kitchen and do child-bearing duties. So uh, Catherine, uh, uh, as a symbol of wildness, wilderness, rebellion, uh, can be taken as a, you know, a, a character that rebels against domestication. Uh, against this uh, authoritarian, patriarchal, male-dominated system of how the woman was viewed. When Catherine says, I am Heathcliff, she displaces this power equation that puts a man in a superior position. So Catherine, as, as a central woman character, is taking on the role of uh, uh, this male character. We can say that, you know, this is... This shows uh, the displacement of power equation in this male-dominated society. When Catherine says, I am Heathcliff, she's displacing the power equations. And uh, she also uh, is able to, you know, sort of take control of her own uh, choices. When she tells uh, Nelly, you know, uh, regarding her, uh, her uh, choice of marrying Edgar Linton, she says, if I marry Linton, I can aid Heathcliff to rise and place him out of my brother's power. So she takes things in her own hand. She is very, in that sense, she's practical enough to understand that a relationship with Heathcliff would not be possible in the society uh, of that time. And so she decides to marry uh, Linton for the sake of, uh, you know, the, the power and uh, uh, the reputation that comes with it. Uh, so that she herself will be in a position to help Heathcliff and take him out of the hands of uh, Hindley, who was mistreating him like anything. Uh, so this is what she tells uh, Nellie, you know, about her decision to marry Edgar. Uh, though Catherine is conscious that she and Edgar are as different to each other as moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire, 
she decides to marry edgar because it is a realistic position to take it's a practical choice that she makes so she gets over uh, the sentimental uh, reasons and makes a realistic choice so catherine's wildness that's the picture of catherine there that you see on your screen Uh, Catherine's wildness is the rejection of her gender identity as defined in a bourgeois society. So, uh, as a you know, a person who is not willing to be part of this male-dominated system, uh, she rejects uh, what her gender entails or what her gender expects of her. Uh, Catherine dying after childbirth is also symbolic of her refusal to be attached to the codes of femininity. to which familial loyalty was important so uh, according to the codes of conduct of the time the woman's role was to take care of the kitchen and be a mother right and uh, we have catherine who dies after childbirth uh, in a way you can see that you know her uh, uh, dying after childbirth as a refusal to stay within the confines of uh, expected codes of femininity Uh, where familial loyalty, loyalty to family, was most important. So she breaks bonds uh, of expectation. Now uh, the question of marriage and the disturbing questions that it uh, places in the novel. We have several examples here of several marriages which are all questionable on one level or the other. Now look at uh, the first example. See, uh, Catherine does not marry Heathcliff, although. Uh, Heathcliff is the one she loves. She does not marry Heathcliff. She marries Edgar. Now Heathcliff marries Isabella, that is Edgar's sister, whom he does not love, but who is infatuated by him. Heathcliff forces Cathy to marry Linton. Cathy is the daughter of Catherine, and uh, Heathcliff Linton is the son of Heathcliff. So Ca uh, Heathcliff forces Cathy to marry Linton, whom she does not. Cathy does not love Linton. But who is loved by Linton in a selfish way? Cathy marries a reformed Hareton. So it is Cathy's love that kind of manages to transform Hareton. And towards the end of the novel, you find it actually ending on a note of happiness when Cathy marries Hareton. Lockwood dreams of marrying Cathy, but discovers first that she is a widow, and later that she is in love with Hareton. So Lockwood, who comes to Thrushcross Grange, sees Cathy and falls in love with her. But then later discovers that she is a widow, and not only that, she is in love with Hareton. And Heathcliff marries Catherine symbolically in death. There is a union that doesn't take place on this earth, but rather uh, after death. So the question of marriage is presented in the novel. Now. Uh, uh, how uh, the marriages that are presented in the novel are problematic uh, francis dies early leaving motherless child to hindley francis is the wife of hindley so she dies early the marriage does not survive for long isabella separates from heathcliff and dies leaving another motherless child catherine dies young leaving a motherless child linton dies linton is the son of uh, heathcliff he dies uh, very young leaving a beautiful young widow cathy lockwood comes to thrushcross grange after an unfruitful affair with a young woman so this, these are the you know questions of marriage and relationships how it ends in separation then <clears throat> <clears throat> uh young cathy is able to free herself from her past by marrying Hareton, who is uh, created by Heathcliff's hateful mind, but reformed by her sympathy and love. So, um, young uh, Cathy, uh, she is uh, able to, you know, she marries uh, Linton, uh, but then the marriage uh, doesn't last long because Linton, uh, Hint, uh, Linton dies early. Yet she is able to uh, redeem herself from her past by marrying Hareton, and Hareton also. Uh, is reformed through the sympathy and love given to him by Cathy, because Hareton has also been um, treated badly by Heathcliff. Once again.
just a minute hold on okay uh then uh <clears throat> the char characteristics of family was changing uh, more support was given to nuclear families reigned by a female monarch uh, key values were stability and continuous so this was the time of queen victoria and uh, a lot of importance was given to uh, a lot of importance was uh, given to nuclear families just a minute huh? i was just trying to okay mm. that catherine plays a mediating role between her father brother husband uh, domesticity and heathcliff uh father brother and husband who symbolize domesticity and heathcliff who symbolizes wilderness or, or, or wildness rather not wilderness wildness so catherine is the force uh, acting between elements of domesticity that is father brother and husband uh, and uh, elements of wildness which is represented by heathcliff now after her father's death she and heathcliff grow increasingly reckless until her stay at thrushcross grange the stress of catherine's relationships is what actually kills her what what destroys her uh, she tells heathcliff you and edgar have broken my heart heathcliff and you both come to bewail the deed to me as if you were the people to be pitied i shall not pity you not i you have killed me and i have thriven on it uh, and have thriven on it i think so she accuses them you know edgar and uh, heathcliff uh, of having broken her heart between the two of them and she says that it is the stress of my relationships with with both of you that is killing me that is taking my life now the metaphor of prison okay it's a repeated motif in uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, in wuthering heights now how is it a repeated motif in uh, wuthering heights Uh, let's study that right lockwood is in danger of being imprisoned in wuthering heights not only because of the weather outside does not permit him to travel back to thrushcross grange but also because the ghosts of the past will trap him with their terrible memories the ghost of the past uh, the nightmares that he has while he is in um, wuthering heights so that is the metaphor of prison there the voice of catherine on shaw implores lockwood to let her in but lockwood refuses to do so and tries violently tries to violently release his hand from the ghostly clasp so she feels imprisoned outside the ghost of catherine feels imprisoned outside and wants to be let in but lockwood refuses then isabella uh, when she is married to heathcliff lives at wuthering heights and feels very imprisoned by heathcliff linton that is their son is forced to leave a comfortable crash cross range and live a miserable life full of complaints at wuthering heights kathy feels imprisoned by heathcliff as his daughter in law on a visit to wuthering heights even nelly feels trapped by heathcliff now catherine expresses her feeling of being imprisoned denied her individual identity so this is how she says this is a quote by catherine i am veering to escape into that glorious world and to be always there not seeing it dimly through tears and yearning for it through the walls of an aching heart so this is what she says at uh, her deathbed you know, i yearn to escape from this world most victorian women writers recognize the fact that writing itself was an act of assertion of their own individualities in a man's world so the very act of writing for a woman writer during the victorian age was like breaking out of prison because it is such a male dominated world for a woman to be able to take up uh, the pen the pen which, which is seen as a symbol of male dominance okay uh, is uh, seen as an act of uh, breaking out of prison itself 
then uh, the critics, you know, how the critics have viewed Wuthering Heights down the ages. Now, criticism that emerged following the publication of the novel to the early years of the 20th century may be called the early phase. Okay. So first we have the early phase, then we have the middle phase, and then we have the last phase of how the book has been interpreted during various times by various critics. Now, critics who came uh, claim the novel uh, uh, as an important work of art and scrutinize it without the constrictions of having to seek moral meanings or social messages in the text dominate the middle phase. Okay, so uh, the first uh, initial phase of criticism that uh, came when the novel was published, when it was not uh, highly regarded by the reading public, that is uh, taken as the early phase. The second phase or the middle phase, we can say, uh, this is seen as a work of art uh, and, uh, you know, not actually uh, trying to read moral meanings or social messages into the text. That's the second phase. And in the last phase, the third phase, marked by critical views of modern critics in the last 20 years, uh, that has been particularly exciting. Uh, and now let's go into more detail. See, early criticism, that is uh, pre-1930s, okay? Uh, presentation of evil incarnate and the tragic and terrible consequences of uh, the physical world. So that is taken as a first section. Now, by the first quarter of the 20th century, new approach, uh, more concerned with the artistic achievement. That, that's what came in the first quarter of the 20th century. For them, the text was crucial and central, which they regarded as a work of art and valued it for the literary skills. So looking at the text, looking at uh, uh, the text as a work of art and the literary skills which went into the production of such a text. New critics and formalists, they gave importance to complex symbolism, imagery, and strange characterization. So they studied the text for the imagery, the symbolism that you would find in it. Then Freudian psychoanalysis. Freudian psychoanalysis interpreted the novel in terms of male and female sexual symbolism. And Marxist critics like Arnold Kettle and Raymond Williams point out how the text directly registers the disturbed and changing social, political, and economic context of the mid-19th century England. And Heathcliff was seen as a symbol of oppression and degradation of the working class. So uh, Heathcliff represented the uh, oppressed working class. Now, in the last 20 years, okay, structuralism, a movement that combined linguistics with anthropology and showed that cultural behaviors of all kinds have a pattern analogous to language and that the meanings that we find in these patterns are socially constructed. So structuralist approach is what happened in the last 20 years, uh, where uh, structuralism is a movement, you know, where uh, linguistics and anthropology was combined, and they studied uh, a text as, you know, a product of cultural behaviors of all kinds, uh, that, you know, has a pattern, which is similar to language, and the meaning that we find in these patterns that uh, is based on the uh, society which constructs it. So structuralism made a deep impact on the way one read a text. Uh, if meaning was related to culture, the text signified more than just the literal meaning. It led to plura pluralities of meaning. It led to multiplicities of meaning. So uh, First is a structuralist approach, okay, where uh, it was studied in terms of uh, language and the meanings that we find in the patterns of language that you find. Patterns of language, again, which is uh, based on how society uh, constructs it. So structuralism was a, one of the ways in which it was read. Later on, deconstructionist approach uh, was taken up, which challenged the structuralist approach. Now, deconstructionist approach means, see, it was inspired by the works of uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, the deconstructionists assert that though the structuralist analyzes language and culture scientifically and objectively and examines how meanings are produced, 
there is always some sort of subjective value judgments by which one meaning is preferred over another uh for example uh if structuralism talks about uh, how we can interpret uh, something in terms of language deconstructionist uh, talks about how uh, whatever we interpret in terms of language or in terms of uh, in terms of uh, a scientific and objective analysis of language uh, can have another side to it which is Uh, ruled by subjective value judgment where we prefer one meaning over another i give you a simple example uh, maybe if i write the word okay d o g what what happens immediately in your mind we we read it as dog and immediately we conjure up a mental uh, picture of a dog i might think of uh, a shih tzu someone else might think of an alsatian another one might think of a pomeranian so what is happening here language is able to rationalize it right language is able to study it scientifically objectively yet be uh, beyond the uh, limits put on by language we are able to apply our own subjective interpretations so there is always something beyond what language the meaning beyond what language assigns to a particular uh image there okay so that is what deconstructionist approach is it challenges the structuralist approach if structuralists try to study everything in terms of uh, language uh, and anthropology and assigned meaning uh, deconstructionist uh, study is uh, through our own subjective individual analysis and preferred meaning that we assign individually so their analysis determines how various cultural patterns prejudices and preferences work into the text and how the dominant value system lies hidden in the text so what we prefer is an indication of uh, the values that are preferred by society at large in one point of time so uh, they say the, the deconstructionists say that uh, cultural patterns and prejudices and preferences lie hidden dormant within the text then uh, going on uh, see michael foucault uh, the french historian theorizes on discourse uh, so foucault is another uh, uh, critic that uh, you need to know about so french uh, historian who is also a theoretician he talks about discourse now discourse is the accepted way of describing and evaluating experience okay anything that we undergo anything that uh, we go through how we describe it and how we evaluate it how we try to describe it that is called as discourse and foucault argues that power social political and economic is maintained through discourse the way in which we interpret what is happening the way in which it is presented that becomes discourse so social power political power and economic power uh, is maintained through discourse many discourses are present in the text of wuthering heights now uh, there is a religious discourse that draws upon the subjects of heaven hell sin redemption and salvation there is discourse on romanticism with its priority on ideal love and heroic isolation Uh, there is uh, also the discourse on magic and myth and folklore these are all elements that you would find in the book the purpose of discourse is to prioritize and centralize certain issues and marginalize some others so uh, through the discourse what we get is that certain uh, uh, ideas and certain issues are given more importance and certain ideas and issues are marginalized towards push to the mar- margins so uh, foucault's discourse theory okay how it studies uh, the book then feminist critics uh, also have studied the book and interpreted it and feminist critics probe the ways and methods by which patriarchal society has been able to dominate and marginalize women's voice uh, especially to writers uh, and their you know ground breaking book the mad woman in the attic the writers are sandra gilbert and susan gubbard and their book mad woman in the attic 
<laughs> this talks about how the woman writer struggles. Now Gilbert, <coughs> excuse me, Gilbert reads Wuthering Heights as Emily Bronte's myth about creation as opposed to the Christian myth of creation that Milton justified in his epic Paradise Lost. Uh, Milton's book Paradise Lost, supposed to be the epic in English literature, talks about uh, creation of Adam and Eve and through the sin of Eve, how uh, paradise is lost to them, how Eden is lost to them, how Satan tempts them and Eden is lost to them. So uh, Gilbert reads Wuthering Heights. So Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubbard. And Gilbert is uh, interpreting the Wuthering Heights as Emily Bronte's myth about creation, which is opposite to that of the Christian myth uh, as written by Milton in Paradise Lost. Now, Emily Bronte's myth challenges the notion of woman's secondness that is central to Miltonic myth. So Mil uh, in Milton's uh, Paradise Lost, Eve is secondary to Adam. Now, Emily Bronte's myth challenges this notion of woman's secondness, is what uh, Gilbert says, Sandra Gilbert says. Yeah, the 19th century was in reality a hell of male domination, authoritativeness and violence. It is into this hell that Catherine falls. And Gilbert draws our attention to the symbolic nature of Catherine's desire to possess a whip as a source of power and strength. So when Earnshaw goes to uh, Liverpool, uh, his children, Kingley and Catherine, ask for gifts. And Catherine asks for a whip. A whip, a whip to be brought, okay? Uh, so a whip with which to beat someone. Whip is a symbol of a power, okay? And uh, Gilbert is, you know, interpreting Catherine's wish to possess a whip as uh, a desire to be a source of power and strength, as a woman's desire to have this source of power and strength within herself. And who becomes her strength and power? Who does? their father bring from the city, Heathcliff. And Heathcliff is the one who becomes the very soul of Catherine, the very strength of Catherine. And together they are a force uh, uh, to be a powerful force against the male domination of her father and brother. Uh, going on, uh, then at uh, Thrush Cross Grange, in Gilbert's words, Catherine is castrated not only by the way uh, she is treated, made into a lady, but also by the way her alter ego, Heathcliff, is separated from her. So uh, there is a sort of, you know, uh, Catherine's power is negated, or some kind of like a castration that happens to her when she goes to Thrush Cross Grange, because there she, her wildness is uh, tamed, uh, and she is made into a lady. And this happens because she is separated from her source of power, her alter ego, which is Heathcliff. And feminist readings of the text sees it as a power struggle by Catherine and how it eludes her. Some feminist critics pointed out that childhood innocence and joy that was lost by Catherine and Heathcliff is regained by Cathy and Hareton in a way that reverses their education and the process of growing up. So what is lost by Heathcliff and Catherine is uh, gained by uh, Cathy and Hareton when they give up their, uh, they unlearn and relearn, you know, uh, their systems and their uh, values and regulations put on them by society. So that is a feminist reading of the book. Now we also have the Marxist reading of the book, Marxist criticism like the feminists, discuss society in terms of unequal distribution of power. Marxist critic Terry Eagleton sees Catherine's choice of Edgar Linton as a compromise that drives both Heathcliff and herself to death. So uh, uh, Catherine choosing Edgar becomes a compromise, which becomes uh, very detrimental to the relationship of Catherine and Heathcliff, which leads to the death of Catherine. Uh, Heathcliff is seen as both oppressed and later as oppressor. So Heathcliff is seen as the underdog, right? In the beginning of the novel, you see him as being oppressed, as being treated badly. But in the second uh, part of the novel, you see him oppressing others. So he becomes a symbol of the oppressor. 
Now, Muriel Sparks sees Heathcliff as a disruptionist, uh, someone who disrupts what is happening, who disrupts the comfort, comfortable and conventional ways of living and thinking. So the Unshaw family, which was based in convention, gets disrupted with the coming of Heathcliff. His presence is something, uh, it's a symbolic, uh, you know, destabilization that happens <clears throat> to the distribution of political, economic and social power. So as someone who has been oppressed, when he comes to this, uh, to this family, uh, the power structure is completely destabilized. The, the mother is worried about inheritance and uh, what the coming of Heathcliff would mean to her own son. So in, in all these ways, you can see Heathcliff is a symbol of disruption, of disruption of the existing systems of uh, power and economic uh, distribution of wealth, etc. Then he is not only seen as, uh, you know, someone who disrupts the power structure, he is also seen as one who disrupts the hypocrisies and falsehoods and superficialities that exist beneath the veneer of moral authority. Uh, moral authority of the father or the uh, brother, uh, he is seen as someone who disrupts that. He is seen as one who gives freedom to Catherine. Catherine is also seen as a disruptionist. You know how uh, this uh, Catherine too disrupts many widely accepted Victorian codes and structures which created women's subordinate position in society. She can be seen as a character who questions Victorian culture. Now, uh, to an Indian reader, you know, how do we uh, react to this? Uh, Emily Bronte's novel opens up the contradictions of a society that sought to colonize the entire world in the 19th century. So uh, this society, the British society that was colonizing the entire world, now the, this uh, shows the contradictions that existed within that society. To the outside world, Britain may have been a big colonizing power, having wealth, having power and everything. Yet within uh, their society, there were these divisions, there were these sections that lived underprivileged lives. This lays bare that aspect of society to us. Now, as Indians, we can relate to this, isn't it? Uh, so see, uh, the British society see, in its search for markets and cheap labor, its attempts at civilizing the native, its introduction of industry and education and its colonies, spread of its institutions like church and judiciary, its morally superior tone, it all becomes very ironic. Right? I mean, when, when the British came here to our country also, they thought that their culture was superior to our culture. Their systems of uh, judiciary was superior to ours. Their system of education was superior to ours. So in everything, you, they felt theirs was better. Their systems were better. That morally superior tone, uh, taking it as an authoritative structure of society, which is patriarchal, which is male-centered, it's not only a British uh, phenomenon, right? It is something that happens in our country also, in our society also, where it is still to a very high degree male-dominated, patriarchal, uh, where women do not find uh, freedom or safety uh, to be there, uh, to express their own identity in full strength, right? So it's it's something that uh, as Indians we can relate to. The kind of oppression that exists in society uh, is something we can relate to. The novel will help us to question any assertion of singularity in our culturally and linguistically plural country. It's not one uh, uh, one uh, section of community, one section of a country that is uh, more powerful or superior to the other, whether you consider uh, the North versus South divide or, you know, the languages divide. So we do not, we are a country which is, uh, which exists in its plural pluralities rather than in, its, uh, in a singularity of one language or one culture or one religion doesn't exist like that. Uh, we do say that diversity is everything as far as our country is concerned. So these are things that we can 
relate to as far as uh, Wuthering Heights is concerned. So that is uh, the entire novel. I have all that I have discussed are things that I have taken from your text. So when you read your text, your material, I think this will make it easier for you to understand that. And I will put a copy of this uh, PowerPoint presentation in our WhatsApp group after the uh, class. After some time, I will put that. Okay, and I will try to uh, you know add on more material to help you. And I, let me stop my presentation now. Okay. Right. So, uh, so how how did you find this novel? How many of you are there? Um, this novel consists of lot of revenge. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, there is a lot of revenge about. Pardon? Suppression of the weak. Suppression of the weak as far as Heathcliff uh, is concerned. Then uh, later on, uh, like I was just telling you, Heathcliff can be seen more, uh, I mean, in both ways, both as the oppressed and the oppressor also. In the first part of the novel, you see him as being oppressed by Kindley, by, you know, uh, the others uh, treated like a, almost like a, a servant not given the position that Earnshaw had assigned to him. But later on, because of uh, this feeling of revenge that uh, Heathcliff has towards uh, everyone else, he tra starts treating others badly. For example, Hindley's son, Hareton, uh, is treated badly. Then Cathy, when she uh, lives in uh, uh, Wuthering Heights, is uh, treated almost like a prisoner. So then he becomes uh, like a, and also the way in which he treats Isabella, the woman he marries, that is Edgar's sister, he treats her pretty badly. So uh, you see him as an oppressor there. Then anything else anyone wants to ask me? It really depicts the life of the people in that Victorian age. It does, uh, yes, it does. Uh, also, it tries to, uh, you know, question uh, life as it existed in Victorian age. All the accepted beliefs and everything, uh, although Emily Bronte does not talk directly about political issues or legislative issues, through the characters and through, a, uh, through an interpretation of uh, the characters, we understand that she is in fact questioning this highly uh, male-centric ideologies that existed at that time. Ma'am, how far criticism, uh, as far as learning it is concerned, uh, how do we do we need to really learn about it? Criticism? Yeah, you might get questions on what is a feminist interpretation of uh, Wuthering Heights, or uh, you, know, you might get a combination. Uh, these interpretations are given actually as a chapter in your uh, book, so it, you must be familiar with these things. You must have these points written down. What I would suggest is that, you know, like we can look for material online. I mean, such a lot of material is available online. Look for credible sources also. Okay, Don't just go for any uh, badly written essay and take it as your uh, main source. Don't do that. Uh, look for valid sources and take down, read it clearly. Try to understand it. Take down points and base your own answer on those points. Important points are relevant anywhere, just like in a science paper, in this literature paper also, your points are, should be to the point, you know, to, like on point, it should contain a relevant matter, not just like any question you get, it should not end in writing summary of the whole novel. That's not an answer. You should have relevant points. And the best thing for you to do for that would be to read these topics as it is given first in your study material, then branch out, read more about it, write down notes, write down your own notes, like in as short a manner as possible. I wouldn't mind if you take down points in bullet format also. 
and then later on you can expand it in your own language thank you ma'am you're welcome okay from the subject ma'am i have a request yeah uh, that uh, i can't attend the cl previous classes uh, so i am not in the whatsapp group of our language so uh, can you add me in that group also sure sure uh, my number is uh, what is my number okay you take down my number and just send me a message and i'll send you the whatsapp invite okay would that work Hello, who was talking to me right now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll just give you my number. Take it down. Okay, ma'am. And send me a text, and then I'll send you the WhatsApp invite. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank so you. So my number is nine seven four six zero. Do you want me to type it there? Yes, ma'am. Nine seven four six uh, zero. zero. Two seven zero two. So that is my number. Let me send. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. I put that on our chat. Okay, Just send me a text, and uh, I'll uh, give you the link to join this WhatsApp group. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So I'll say bye bye to all of you. Uh, yeah. Talk about the assignment. Okay. Somebody is just asking about. So, uh, one of the questions that I saw here in, uh, I think this is for the July 2020 batch, 2020, 2021 assignment that I found. Uh, you'll have to double check whether this is a version that you guys are writing answers to. Uh, as far as Wuthering Heights is concerned, uh, see the various narrative techniques in Wuthering Heights. Evaluate various narrative techniques in Wuthering Heights. Critically, we dealt with that in detail now, right? Uh, there were several slides in which I continued talking about the narrative uh, details of Wuthering Heights, how it has multiple narrators, and how these multiple narrators add to the meaning of, uh, you know, uh, the book and the whole problem of the narrative. In fact, it is one whole chapter in your study material uh, in your uh, Igno study material. Unit two is about the problem of the narrative. Then, uh, what else did you want to ask me about the assignment? Uh, okay, uh, as if you are talking to me in general about the assignments, you will have to write the five essays, and each essay carries twenty marks. And uh, uh, writing an assignment means you have to read the question, find out what they want you to write. And uh, write focused on the question. Uh, it does not mean you write a general summary for everything. Okay, so uh, maybe four or five pages for uh, an essay would be good. Okay, because sometimes I get assignments that are kind of as long as a novel itself. That doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So you you have to be aware of how you're writing, what you're writing, and make sure that. You know your examiner who gets to read your assignment uh, is able to find the points written with clarity uh, and easily readable. So those are the general things that you need to keep in mind about the assignments. All right then. So shall we end the class now? I have taken up more than like four thirty-five. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. It was a nice class. Thank you. I'm glad you stayed with me to the end because I see there is a <laughs> decrease. Yes, okay then. Huh? Bye bye. See you all next week. You're welcome, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye bye.